How do fixed income markets quantify time? Now, quantifying time might seem like an obvious issue. There's days and years dictated by the solar cycle. There's hours and minutes and seconds, uh, perhaps a man-made arbitrary measure that some people date back to the Sumerians or at least the ancient Middle East. On the other hand, time can get quite a bit more complicated. Uh, physicists will talk about the arrow of time, uh, because some think time can only move in one direction. On the other hand, uh, Einstein wrapped time into the space-time continuum, and physicists now talk about slices in space-time and time dilation when the speed of some one relative to an observer approaches the speed of light. Well, we're not going to go into cosmology at all. but. For those not already familiar with the issue, measuring time in the fixed income markets is not as straightforward as it might seem or as might be hoped. Because there are a number of different ways of quantifying time, and that leads to a number of complications, both in terms of computing interest on fixed income contracts, or even in a way that represents a greater problem, comparing relative value on different securities on a rate basis where the two securities are using different conventions for quantifying time. Hi, I'm Doug Carroll for Insider's Guide to Finance.com with more fixed income market conventions and jargon. This will be a first in a series of several videos that will look at the issues of day count conventions. In this uh, video, we'll simply introduce the different day count conventions and some of the related issues. Subsequent videos will consider the issue both in a mechanical sense, where we'll look at the computation of accrued interest for determining the value of bond settlement prices using different day count conventions. In a separate video, we'll look at the complications that different day count conventions create for assessing the relative value on different securities by comparing their conventionally calculated rate quotes when the accrued interest calculations in the different securities are based on different day count conventions. While there are others, there are three widely used day count conventions in the U.S. fixed income markets. 3360, actual over 360, and actual days. Now, that last one is sometimes referred to as actual over actual, because you'll note that uh, uh, the first two day count conventions I introduced are expressed as something over something, and the human eye tends to recognize patterns more readily. So actual days is, as I indicated a moment ago, sometimes expressed as actual over actual. Although it, that is sometimes confused with actual over 365, which is something different, but we'll, we'll get into those issues as part of this video. So 3360. In other words, that's a day count convention where we're assuming every month is 30 days long, and naturally a year made up of 12 30-day months is a 360-day year. That is by far the most widely used convention in terms of number of fixed income market segments that have their calculations based on that convention. So 3360 is used for corporate bonds, municipal bonds, uh, government agency securities, uh, mortgage backs, asset backs. So the majority of different sectors use that 3360 convention. And for what it's worth, sometimes you'll see books refer to a commercial year. That's code phrase for 3360. Second one actual over 360. In other words, we'll count the actual number of calendar days, but we'll still assume a 360-day year. Actual over 360 is the norm for money market instruments, though so there's a, it's more complicated than this in the real world, generally securities with a year or less to maturity from the date of issuance. And that's true not just of things like commercial paper or repurchase agreements or muni notes, it's also true of T-bills, because even though Treasury bonds and notes use a different date count convention, T-bills use a convention consistent with other money market instruments. Now, why the 360 divisor on those first two date count conventions? Well, of course, in the pre-calculator, pre-computer ages, it was much easier to divide by 360 than 365 or 366 when doing computations longhand. Now, 
Most of you are probably thinking, well, but now we have calculators and computers, so why do we need to use the simplification of a 360-day year? Well, as we'll see as part of this discussion, there is no ideal day count convention. All of them have their quirks. And in just a sort of a pedestrian sense, think of the complications that would be engendered by shifting the markets that use those other conventions into an actual day basis. Think of all the lines of computer code that would have to be rewritten. Think of all the legal contracts that would have to be adjusted if we were to dispense with those day count conventions. Now, you might say, well, why the difference? Well, many money market instruments are very short term, 30 days, 7 days, sometimes overnight, so each day matters. So we don't want to make a, a general assumption about the, the, the length of the month. And in 3360, note that that implies that going from the same day of the month to the same day of the following month or any subsequent month is always 30 days apart. So if I'm going from the 10th of one month to the 10th of the following month, it doesn't matter whether the actual number of calendar days is 28, 29, 30, or 31. By convention, going from the same day of one month to the same day of the following month will be 30 days. Now, the last of the, the three conventions, actual days or actual or actual, that's the convention used by treasury bonds and treasury notes. In other words, coupon treasury securities. Now, most books where I've encountered a discussion of the day count convention for treasury bonds and notes, they'll refer to it as actual over 365. And that's wrong. It's actual over actual. Now, I suspect some of the viewers are thinking, what's the diff? <laughs> actual days, uh, actual over 365, it's the same thing. No, it isn't. First off, as we'll see in one of the subsequent videos, mechanically, when you compute the accrued interest on a treasury security, what's in the formula for computing the accrued interest is the actual number of days of accrued interest divided by the actual number of days in the coupon period. But aside from that, just to address the issue more directly, think of what are the implications of actual days versus actual over 365. By implication, what would be the daily accrual as a percent of the total year's interest if the day count convention is actual over 365 for a non-leap year? Well, of course, for a non-leap year, each day ought to generate 1 365th of the year's interest. And I suspect many people are saying, yes, yeah, so what? Well, think then of the implications of that for a semi-annual pay coupon bond, which is the norm for treasury bonds and treasury notes. For you to be accruing exactly 1 365th of the year's interest each day, each coupon period would have to be exactly one half of a year long, because each of the two semi-annual coupons is for exactly one half of the year's interest. Well, note, that would mean that for at least in a non-leap year, the length of a coupon period would have to be 182 and a half days. I dare anyone to identify for me a treasury bond or note that has a coupon period of 182 and a half days. Now don't laugh. That was the day count convention in the UK gilt market and the UK government bond market up until somewhere in the early 1990s. They used actual over 365 and the assumed length of a coupon period was 182 and a half days. But in the early 90s, the UK market, UK government bond market shifted over to the, the actual days convention. So now it looks, works like the US Treasury market. So when you're looking at a typical Treasury bond or note, the, yeah, the non leap year has a length of 365 days, but the coupon period split between 181 and 184 most of the time. Although for some issues, they'll split 182, 183. But that means the length of the two coupon periods is different. So in the different halves of the year, you're generating interest at a slightly higher daily rate in the short coupon period and interest at a slightly lower daily rate in the long coupon period. Because again, each coupon is for exactly one half of the year's interest, even though the lengths of the two coupon periods are just a little bit longer or a little bit shorter than a half year. Now, just a couple of their quirks in this introductory video on day count conventions. Think of the implications for 3360 in terms of daily accrual. Well, just to, to put it in context, let's say we're looking at the number of days of accrued interest for some bond for the month of February. Now, in another video on accrued interest, we talked about the conventions, but just to remind everyone, 
the seller of the bond gets the accrued interest up to but not including the settlement date because from the settlement date forward it's the buyer who's earning the accrued interest. So think about the number of days of accrued interest one would earn for the month of February depending upon the settlement date. Let's first assume that trade settles on, this is in a non-leap year, the trade settles on the 28th of the month. Well, of course, the seller would get 27 days of accrued interest for the month of February, every day up to but not including the settlement date. What happens if the trade settles one day later on March 1st? Well, of course, if the trade settles on March 1st, the seller gets 30 days of accrued interest for the month of February. In other words, for bonds using the 3360 day count convention at the end of the month of February, you get three days worth of interest for holding the bond one more day, so the trade settles on the March 1st rather than February 28th. Now, of course, the flip of that is true for the long months. There's seven days in the year when in theory you're not earning any interest whatsoever because any time there's a 31st of the month, there's no accrual of interest on a bond that uses the 3360 day count convention. So similar to the last example, now consider the days of accrued interest we'll earn for a bond being sold near the end of the month of August. How many days of accrued interest does the seller get if the trade settles on the 31st of August? Well, they get 30, of course. But what happens if the trade settles one day later on September 1st? The, the seller still only gets 30 days of accrued interest for the month of August because there isn't a 31st of the month, at least in the 3360 day count convention. Now, of course, it's more complicated than that. There's actually several variations of 3360 because think of the implications of a bond that has coupon payment dates near the end of the month of August and the end of the month of February, some annual pay. Oh, the day count gets complicated, but those complications are beyond the scope of this video. But I'll leave you with one last issue, one sort of quandary, and many of these issues will be explored in more detail in the follow-up videos. But what's more valuable, a basis point or a basis point? Now, specifically, what's more valuable, a basis point on something like a CD or a repurchase agreement, i.e. a money market instrument, or a basis point on a corporate bond? You might say, well, a basis point is a basis point. Oh, no, <laughs> not if the securities use different date count conventions. So what's more valuable, a money market basis point or a bond basis point? Well, of course, in a bond basis point, over the course of a year, you're earning exactly one year's worth of interest. But what about in a full calendar year on a money market instrument? Well, at least for a non-leap year, there's 365 days in the year. But remember, on money market instruments, the day count is actual over 360. So for a money market instrument that runs for a full year, you're actually earning 365 360ths of whatever the, the annualized rate on that security is. So it turns out that a money market basis point is more valuable than a bond basis point. I hope you enjoyed this video. You can go to our YouTube channel or Facebook page to see other videos on a range of investment related topics. Or you can go to the website, insidersguidetofinance.com. At our website, in addition to the free video shorts, there are a series of modestly priced in-depth training videos with running times of approximately one hour each that go into a number of subjects in greater detail. The website and Facebook page also contain information about open enrollment programs I will be presenting over the next few months and my recently released book, The Insider's Guide to Fixed Income Securities and Markets.